Hello everyone, you're watching episode 160 of Let's Plant. My name is Chuck. You're probably wondering why I didn't put out an episode last week. It was mainly because it has been raining during the weekend and it was also raining last night which meant that the ground is wet and I haven't been able to do any landscaping and planting because of that. So between the lockdown and the rain, this gave me a lot of time to think especially with the pandemic happening right now. And it got me thinking, you, I'm pretty sure you've seen this, but there are a bunch of posts, a bunch of photos going around about how the world seems to be resetting or resting or revitalizing. You know? um, cities which usually have a smoggy, foggy or smoke-filled skylines are now clearer than usual. Basically, the gist is that the Earth is finally getting a breather, which is probably one good thing that came out of this pandemic, at the very least. Anyway, on to the topic of this video. I was thinking that, you know, what if we had a gardening-related pandemic, you know, very strictly just gardening-related, where for some reason all of, the, all of the plants that we have in our collection right now just vanished, just disappeared without a trace, and we had to start over. What would you do? I'm not trying to approach it from a grim standpoint. What I mean is that if you had the chance to start over with your collection and retain everything that you know right now, you know, all of the resources that you've spent are magically reimbursed. So you have the you still have the initial resources that you would need to start collecting or you know do whatever you need to do. Basically you have the cash, the resources, but none of the plants. What would you do? Imagine having a reset button placed right in front of you. Would you press it? And what would you do after it? Well, it just so happens I have a keyboard here and I'm going to press a button. The button has been pushed, we have now reset. Look around me, these are not plants, you're imagining things. These are just weeds and grass and whatever sort of bushes, not succulents. Now, what do we do? Now, you have to forgive me for having my laptop right in front of me, because like I said, the lockdown and the rain gave me a lot of time to think. So I actually wrote down a huge list of things that I would do. And to start things, we have to come up with a plan and no plan is ever good without knowing what the goals are. So let's list down some of our goals. So I'd like to classify my goals according to the time limit or the scope that they contain. So I guess we would have to divide them into short-term goals, medium-term goals, and long-term goals. So for my long-term goals, I've wrote down a couple. And the first one is to have a large succulent garden where I can show off my Echeveria. You're not seeing anything, everything's bare, so we don't have that yet. And I think it is a long-term goal because, you know, I don't think I'll be satisfied just having a simple design, a simple arrangement. I would like to continuously improve it, so it might be even a lifelong goal, you know? It depends. The second long-term goal is to collect at least half of the known Echeveria specimens. Because as far as hybrids are concerned, there's thousands of them available in the world. A lot of nurseries produce new hybrids every year and it would be very hard to keep up. But compare that to the number of species which is about at least 165. It sounds more reasonable, right? My medium term goal is to be able to put out my own signature list of hybrids. So we, have, we would have a Seriska page line of Echeveria hybrids. I think that would be nice. And finally, for my short-term goal, remember, I still have to work on my garden, which is currently bare and just full of weeds and grass. First short-term goal is to clean up the garden. Yeah, lots of cleanup to do. Look at the tall grass and the weeds. They're so annoying, right? And the second short-term goal is to define our growing spaces. Now, let's start with the short-term goals. Those are easier to define. So my first short-term goal is to clean up the garden. This part is really easy if you think about it, but it requires you to have defined where you're going to grow things. But you know, as soon as you have that, as soon as you have your plans and your layout and your design, it's just a matter of the tedious work of removing the weeds and you know trimming what needs to be trimmed. 
and removing what needs to be removed, you know, just to create a space for you to work around it. Generally, just tidying up. Easy peasy. The next short-term goal is to define the growing spaces. Again, this might sound easy, but there's a lot of thought and planning that goes into it. As you see, you would need to figure out a few things. Number one, what sort of plants you would be using or what sort of plants you're going to collect. This is mostly a preference sort of thing, but you also have to factor in some practicality into it. So these are factors such as the availability of the plants, your climate and how the plants tolerate your climate, and maybe even how much time you are able to allocate to gardening. In my case, being in Australia, I have to be mindful of the biosecurity laws. We have such laws here and quarantine. I'm pretty sure every, every country has their own set of quarantine laws when it comes to plant materials and byproducts. Just know that it is quite stricter here in Australia. There's a whole list of things that we are not allowed to import. And this list differs from state to state. Basically, all I'm saying is that I do not want to break any laws because of my hobby, you know? It's just not worth it. I know some people are going to struggle with this. So my advice here is for you to just turn to social groups, community groups, Facebook groups, or YouTube channels, <coughs> sorry, scapades, where people collect plants that you are fascinated with or interested in. So in your case, in our case, just join a few or many <laughs> succulent groups around the world and just enjoy the plants that other people post. So basically what I'm saying is that you just have to live vicariously through their collection. In my case, a lot of you know that I like collecting large, freely carunculated Echeveria plants and because of that, I am in the Dick Wright Echeveria cultivars group. I just appreciate seeing the plants that other people post and, you know, I know I won't be able to get them and I've already resigned to that fact. So I just appreciate the plants that they post. Nothing wrong with that, you know. And again, regarding the plants, I would need to classify them according to the type or the, how they grow. So I would have an area reserved for clumping plants just to, you know, just to let them spread in there. I would have an area for tall plants, maybe even something based on their growing patterns. So maybe an area for winter growers or stuff like that. It depends on how you organize your plants. So I guess that third point is mainly about how you would want to organize your garden or at least how you would want to organize your plants. So the first point was about the plants. The next point is about materials. The first thing you would have to ask yourself is, are you going to plant them in the ground or in pots? And the answer to that is mainly tied to your climate. So if you live in a very wet climate, you might want to do a lot of special preparation if you want to keep them in the ground or even in pots. There's a lot of things you have to consider. On the flip side, if you live in a very dry area, then you know this means that if you're doing them in pots, you would want to go with less porous pots, maybe steer clear of uh, porous spots such as terracotta or concrete and use more of those the, the sealed pots or glazed pots or plastic pots that way you know the plants do not dry out too fast unless unless you're willing to water them more frequently than usual so it's a balancing act there are many things that you have to think about when thinking about soil first one of course is drainage and there's a lot of ways you could adjust drainage. It's basically about thinking about the type of aggregate that you add into your soil mix just to keep things loose. You would also have to consider if you have the right type of soil. So clay soil, generally a no-no because you know, it prevents water from draining properly and it creates pools of water, which is no good. If you think that you're going to need lots of soil, rather than spending on individual bags, why not buy them in bulk, you know? Maybe get a cubic meter or something, you know? Split with a friend if necessary. So this is where landscaping materials providers come in. In my case, that would be Soilworks. And if you happen to be in Melbourne, do check them out. This is their website. It's soilworks.com.au. I get my soil and my gravel from them. There are lots of succulent tutorials, soil mix tutorials online on YouTube. And, you know, rather than beating a dead horse you could just go watch some of them go ahead i won't hold it against you if you look at other channels because i'm not really a pot person i'm more of a ground person and my recommendations might be different from theirs of course 
this only makes sense because my growing conditions are different from theirs. So my advice on this point is just to watch as much videos on soil mix as you can and try to absorb the information, you know, and the more you know, the easier it would be for you to determine which would be the better fit for your climate. So best if the person you're watching or the person with the guide lives in a similar climate as yourself because there's less for you to fiddle around with. They have done most of the legwork and you know, you could just try it and see if it works and just adjust. Regardless of which soil composition you go for, there's only one thing that you have to know and it has to pass the wet clump test. So basically how you do it is you drench the whole soil mix, then you would have to grab a clump, then release and see if it just crumbles in your hand. If it crumbles readily, crumbles apart, then that means that it is loose enough. But if it stays as a ball or a clump, then that's no good. It means that you would need to add more aggregates, more pebbles, sand or whatever, just to make them uh, break apart easily. Loose soil means more drainage and more airflow. And that's definitely important for succulent plants. On the other hand, if you're going to do this in the ground, then boy, I have lots of experience in this regard. But again, be mindful of the difference in our climates. You might have to do things more extreme than myself when you're living in a, in a humid environment or somewhere in the tropics. Otherwise, if you live in temperate climates or, you know, climates which isn't constantly wet, then my, my method might work for you. For more details, you could check out my video on soil mix. I, I have a lot of them and I think this one would be the best demonstration. So just click the link here or down in the description. But generally speaking, in ground, the water tends to dissipate in more directions than just straight down compared to pots. In pots, unless your pots are porous or has porous walls such as terracotta, the plant the water can only escape through the um, drainage holes at the bottom. And that means that in the ground, you have more leeway when it comes to drainage compared to pots. Of course, when planting in the ground, you would need larger volumes of soil. So you have to be practical in this regard. Use cheaper aggregates when possible. For instance, in my case, scoria is cheap. So I would use it over perlite because perlite is more expensive by volume where I'm from. And besides, I'm not really concerned about the weight because I have them in the ground. So it doesn't matter that scoria is heavier than perlite. It's not going to be in pots. I'm not going to lift my, my soil in the ground all of the time. Another thing to consider is if you're planting them in the ground, you need to provide enough airflow for your plants. So <laughs> this is stupid practice social distancing <laughs> but in my case since as you know i like doing tapestries and um crowded crowded designs what that basically entails is having to clean up the bottom remove all of the dead leaves make sure there's still flow of air and another thing that you could do to increase airflow is to shape your landscape such that you are able to direct airflow so you, if you need to create slopes, then so be it. Maybe a raised part of the garden or a lower part of the garden. That way, you know, when wind blows like it is right now, uh, air has to go somewhere. It has to be directed somewhere. And moving air or wind is always good because that aids a lot in the evaporation process. And of course, provide drainage. Just make sure that there are channels from where water would flow. So when in doubt, just do a drainage test. Just soak the whole garden bed in water and see if um, water is flowing outwards or away from the plants. That would be good. So mounding or shaping would really help here. And yeah, basically just provide good drainage. If your soil is clay, break it apart using rocks, you know, mix it with rocks or mix it with, you know, whatever you have, whatever sort of material you have. Just make sure that it pass passes the wet clump test as well. The third thing that you would need to consider would be the light levels. So it's mainly about how much light your plants need versus the amount of light you could provide. This can be climate specific and at the same time, it can also be dependent on the amount of space that you have so if you have an open space like i do then you're in luck because you could use the sunlight but if you have a tiny space then you would have to be very creative and grow lights are hella expensive so you would have to be content with a few plants or just even having a tiny shelf especially during winter you would have to stay within your capacity things to watch out for when it comes to light first is to 
check out what your climate is. So in my case, I have a temperate climate. We have four seasons. The four seasons are distinct. I, based on the USDA hardiness zones, a scale used by United States, I am in hardiness zone somewhere between 9B and 10A. And that basically means that during winter, we are mostly above freezing temperatures, but sometimes it can dip just below freezing point. This means that I generally do not have to worry about frost because when frost forms, they tend to just melt right away in the morning or they, they just slide off. So to deal with frost, I usually just make sure to plant my plants at an angle. That way, any water or any frost or any buildup would just flow out or out and away from the leaves due to gravity assisting them. On the flip side, you would also have to check if you need to protect your plants in summer. In my case, I no, there's nothing here yet. I usually set up shade structures, so basically put up posts and put shade cloth, tie some, tie some shade cloth on them. That way, the plants would have a bit of protection during the, the hottest parts of summer. And I usually do this once the temperatures start going above 30 to 35 degrees Celsius, because during those parts of summer, our temperatures can spike to as high as about 50 to 52 degrees Celsius. That's around 120 Fahrenheit, I think, and that's really hot. So a bit of filtering is needed to keep the plants from burning. If you have an open space like I do, you would have to check if it is an open spot. Are there things overhead, maybe some trees or a neighbor's roof or whatnot? So check for anything that, you, that could cast shadows because that would determine how much sunlight your plants would get throughout the day. Because as you know, unless you have been living underground for most of your life or indoors, the sun rises from the east and sets in the west, which means that at times of day, it is at an angle casting shadows. So you're mostly concerned about how much direct sunlight your plants can get. Different plants have different light requirements. So this is a topic for another video, but just know that different plants will not necessarily enjoy the same so you'd have to put a lot of thought into this one strategy you could use is by the use of indicator plants i've mentioned this a few times in the course of the let's plant series but i can't remember what episode so maybe i could work on a separate video for that but the gist is that you could take a plant that you commonly have something that you're very familiar with and plant it all around or place it all around the garden or everywhere that you plan to uh, create garden beds or place your plants and see how they do in each of those spots. Now, I assume that you are familiar with how that, that chosen plant grows. So if you see that this plant is not doing so well in one of the spots that you use for it, then you would know how to adjust to make it more habitable. And you know, if it does perfectly well in the spot that you chose, then you would know that other plants with similar characteristics or similar requirements would work well in that area as well. So basically, having indicator plants allows you to map which areas are usable, which ones aren't but could still be adjusted, and which ones are off limits. And another very commonly asked question with succulent plants is the watering. I have an entire video about it, so rather than going through the whole thing, I would just have to point you to that video. The link would be here or down in the description. Basically, you just have to make sure that the plant gets enough water that it needs in order to stay um, plump and not wrinkly. And water does not necessarily mean the water that you spray or hose on top of it, but it also includes the humidity from, from the atmosphere. So you have to keep that into account. Those of you in the tropics will definitely know how easy it is to overwater plants because it's almost always humid, especially during the wet season. So, you know, you just have to be more careful. My strategy is just to periodically let my mature plants experience some drought. So deprive them of water just enough to make sure that they do not start wrinkling up or shriveling up. Because that means that they remain stressed and stressed plants means more colors. And I like my display area to be colorful. So more stress, more fun. But take note that I only do this to my mature plants. As for the younger ones, I give them more water or at least the amount of water that they need to stay alive because they are actively growing and they would not be able to survive extended periods of drought, at least not the same as the mature plants. The fifth note would be about maintenance. 
So I'm not just talking about the plant care and keeping them alive. I'm also talking about the, the physical and practical aspects of gardening. So you would be asking yourself things like how easy it is to work around in the garden. Are the plants in hard to reach areas? Is it going to be difficult for you to clean them up or you know pull dead leaves? Because that's something that you would have to be periodically doing anyway. Would you have enough space to wheel in your stuff? Like in my case, I have a wheelbarrow that I use to work around in sometimes. Are your plants under trees or flowering bushes? Because that would be a problem. Because whenever they shed leaves or petals, they tend to smother your plants, creating uh, excess humidity and even lead your plants to rotting. So what you could do is to either you know, place a barrier, a net to keep them from falling over your plants or maybe even trim the branches of the trees or bushes if that's an option. Or you could just deal with the fallen leaves and petals and just manually pull them out yourself. Another maintenance thing that I do is to periodically remove flower stalks, especially during summer because a lot of insects are active during summer and flowers are a vector for infestation because a lot of insects, especially ants, bring, bring in the mealybugs and attract aphids to the plant. So in order to fight that, you would have to remove most, if not all, of the flower stalks. So again, <laughs> ah, this is stupid. Practice social distancing, especially if you're starting to see signs of infestation. Of course, apply your pesticide of choice. I like using uh, systemic pesticides because I have my plants in the ground. I do not want having to pull out my plants and you know just digging through all of them. I would just like to apply some pesticides on them and let it do its thing. Of course, I just have to make sure that there are no flower stalks. But yeah, that's my approach. But if you want to keep the flowers for any purpose, such as maybe propagation, then remove the flower stalks, chop them off first and replant before applying the pesticides. So with all of those things in mind, I came up with this strategy. So I have been collecting for four years so far and I would like, and I think I'd be able to condense them into two years if I knew what I was doing at the very beginning. So during the first year, what I would do is just to purchase mature plants. I would stay away from any of the younger plants, the smaller cheap plants, because that would save me a lot of time trying to grow them up and propagate them. Mature plants are more likely to push out pups and I would avoid the heartache of them dying on me because they are already well established, they are healthy. All I have to do is to find spots that work for them in the garden and I could start doing my propagation regimen. Obviously, compared to young plants, mature plants are faster to propagate with because they are already established. They have a well-established root system and that means that they already have the infrastructure to feed all of the pups that they produce. If you have a mature plant and chop off its rosette, then that means that any of the pups that would grow would have access to the amount of resources that otherwise would have gone to the bigger plant. So yeah, imagine how much resources and nutrients that is. I've already done several videos on this. Here's one of the recommended ones. But basically what I do is to chop off the head. I keep the head and the stump in a shaded spot. Bright spot but shaded away from direct sunlight. That way they do not dry out easily. As soon as the head grows roots, that's when I would transfer it into soil. Whether in pots or in the ground doesn't really matter as long as it does not burn easily, especially since I had it in the, in the shade. Keeping it in bright shade is vital because you would still want to encourage it to grow and keeping it in relaxed conditions would allow it to continue growing. I'll completely ignore leaf propagation altogether because that's too slow. So the only propagation methods that I would really do is via the flower stalks. Here's a video, if you want to watch it, I highlighted the different ways you could propagate off of flower stalks. So I would propagate by flower stalks and head cuttings. I prefer those two over leaf cuttings because leaf cuttings take up a lot of space and a long time. The pups on the stumps, as mentioned earlier, would grow a lot faster compared to the pups that you get from leaf propagation. So if you try having them side by side, you would definitely see the difference in the growth rates. If I kept doing this, then it, this means that by the second year, I would have way more pups than otherwise if I just went for the leaf propagation method. And also by the second year, those pups might be mature enough to be used for propagation and that only means exponential growth. Plus, they're easier to maintain. There's less worry about watering and misting them, you know, because with leaves, you never know. It's so easy to mess it up. Now, with regards to protection, as I mentioned earlier, I might place a shade structure on top of them. 
especially during the warmer months and during the colder months i just have to make sure that it does not freeze over so it depends on your climate mainly in my case i have an ideal climate for echeverias it does not freeze where i am or at least any frost that forms they melt right away in the morning all i really have to worry about is the amount of light available and during winter our daylight is much less compared to during summer but thankfully the plants that i care for are echeveria and echeverias are summer growers they go dormant during winter which you know balances things out because even though they do not get enough sunlight during winter they do not completely etiolate because they are not actively growing anyway you know they just shut down in terms of growth so it all works out the strategy is to keep doing that which means that by the second year i would have more plants to propagate with i could keep repeating this process over and over throughout the years and I would just be overflowing with plants and like I also mentioned earlier I have I would have a designated spot for my clumping plants where I would just allow them to spread and I would just pluck the pups and as soon as the pups are large enough I would pluck them from the parent plant and replant them spaced far apart again this is stupid social distancing <laughs> just so they have enough space for them to spread the roots and gather more water than otherwise you know just leaching off of one of the parent plants i will keep repeating this year on year for as long as i need materials for my landscapes and going back to leaf propagation would i ever do that maybe as a final resort let's say if a plant is rotting and i want to save it or if i bought a plant just one plant and there's no and i won't be able to find it anywhere and i just want to have an insurance policy of you know just in case the main plant dies at least i would have some few pups growing but even so i still think that i would just wait for flower stalks or wait for it to mature and you know propagate from those because those are safer for me and less hassle so yeah not really a fan of leaf propagation if you haven't figured that out yet so that's it for my short short to long term plans now for my medium term plan which was about creating my own hybrids i've already started doing this so you might have seen my videos on this but it's mainly about getting the technique down just getting myself familiar with how things work and getting comfortable with you know uh, how to go about with pollination i think i already got in the technique because i've managed to grow some plants so the next phase is gathering the gene pool that i would want to play with and creating a proper sterile area away from the pollinators there's something about pollination that i learned a while back from my friend ron apostol from the philippines when creating hybrids you would need to be familiar with the concept of clones i will be providing a link in the description to his full post on the matter it's very informative i highly recommend that you read it but the gist is I wrote down some notes here. An individual plant has its traits or genes. If you make a copy of that plant, then this copy is an exact replica of the parent plant. It would have the same genes or traits as the parent plant. This happens when you do any sort of asexual reproduction, such as leaf cuttings, head chops to produce offsets, tissue culture, or whatnot. Anything that is not involving two plants or pollination so basically you're producing exact copies of the parent plant in other words all of the plants that you create using these techniques are all clones so if you take an echeveria and manage to grow a new echeveria out of it using leaf cuttings or maybe head chops then these two individuals are clones of each other sexual reproduction happens when you take genetic information from two different plants or two different sets of genes or traits and this happens during pollination ron has noted that a vast majority of succulents are self-sterile which means that they cannot pollinate with themselves so if you were thinking of taking pollen from one flower of a certain plant and just transferring it over to the stamens of the of another flower of the same plant then that would not work it would not be providing viable seeds at least and there would not be any genetic diversity in place so you will not be able to successfully breed them unfortunately a lot of the plants that you see in big box stores or even in collectors are just clones of each other because they are likely um, mass produced mass propagated by a nursery they are the exact same plant so your best bet for doing any pollination is to pollinate two completely different plants different hybrids or if possible even different species that way you are sure that 
the genetic material of one plant is different from the genetic material of the other plant. Again, if you want to know more, the link is down in the description. Finally, over to my long-term plan of creating a succulent garden. Now, this one is probably what this entire Let's Plant series is about. It is my journey, you know, creating the landscape or the garden that I want. My dream garden, I guess. Or at least making my dream garden a reality. <laughs> We're starting from scratch. We just have barren land, grass, and weeds at the back. So, you know the possibilities are endless anyway let's snap out of that scenario look the plants came back <laughs> there's still a lot that i wanted to do here my current focus is on getting you know getting vertical creating some heights and i've already started that with this pergola i want to do more vertical structures in other parts of the garden but not just yeah i'm not going to create more pergolas i think I'll have to be creative and work on something else but you know I'll reveal it when I'm ready because they are all still vague plans in my head. So if you want to keep up with my plans and my progress then you know what to do subscribe. Right and my other long-term goal was to collect at least half of the species so as I noted um, there are at least 165 known species of Echeveria. There might be more left undiscovered, but yeah, 165 are recognized. The others are deprecated or at least synonyms of other, you know, they have been reclassified or renamed. Based on my research, it's 165. Those of you who have been following me for a while would know me to be an Echeveria collector, and you might think that my collection is extensive, which might be, <laughs> but in reality, I would not be able to collect all of the available hybrids in the world because you know nurseries keep coming up with new hybrids every year and there's no way for me to be able to keep up i don't think i'll be able to gather them all much less try to fit them in my garden unless i i am filthy rich and manage to purchase hectares and hectares of property <laughs> ah hmm, maybe that should be my long-term plan so instead my goal as a collector is to collect at least half of these 165 species. So far, based on my spreadsheet, I've only managed to collect about 20%. So that's, up. that's after four years of collecting. There's still a long way to go. I'm mainly limited by the availability of things here in Australia, especially with the biosecurity concerns. So yeah, I think gathering the next 30% would take me close to a lifetime and that is why I made it into a long-term goal because I don't think it's going to be completed anytime soon especially where I live those of you in other areas with more lax biosecurity restrictions might have an easier time doing this but in my case 50% is uh, I think it is a huge number so yeah good luck to me <laughs> also you know what these days I find that I'm no longer I'm at a stage where I am no longer aggressively purchasing new plants. Especially the lockdown these days, I think it is my social responsibility not to order anything else right now because I do not want to clog the postal system with my orders when you know the same those resources could have gone into transporting essential goods and services to people that need them. But anyway, that's me. Now I pass on the question to you. What would you do if you had the reset button and you are able to start over with all of your resources, with all of your knowledge, but none of the plants? So you're going to purchase things again from scratch. What would you do and what would you have done differently? Let me know your thoughts down in the comments and I look forward to reading them all. And unfortunately, that's all of the time we have for this video and it has already gone long enough. So I'll see you in the next one. Bye.